Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, and theta meditation teacher. Above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on a quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What life is all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. Welcome to the brand new, exciting season four of Quantum Living. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Today's episode combines some of my favorite topics, energy healing, the quantum nature of reality, psychic abilities, communicating with the other side, ghosts. <laughs> so much to talk about, so let's go right into it. My special guest today is Julie Ryan, an inventor, entrepreneur, and businesswoman turned psychic and medical intuitive. She can sense what medical conditions and illness a person has and facilitate energetic healing. She can communicate with spirits on this and on the other side, scan animals, access people's past lives, and can tell how close to death someone is. Julie has written and published four books and hosts her own weekly podcast, Ask Julie Ryan. And to talk about this and so much more, she joins me now from Birmingham, Alabama. Hello, Julie. Welcome to Quantum Living. How are you? I'm terrific. Thanks so much, Ms. Anna. I'm thrilled to get to be here. Thank you so much for joining me today. I love talking to psychics, I must say. I love exploring those mystical skills we call paranormal, while actually we all have the sixth sense and can learn to use it if we want to. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yes, we're all born with the ability. It's just a matter of developing and then enhancing it. Yes. So how did you develop your psychic abilities? I understand uh, from your bio that uh, you have learned them, which means, as I've just said, we can on all learn how to use them. So how did you develop your psychic abilities, such as distant healing and perceiving energy in other dimensions? I went to school. I went to, I studied a curriculum for six years. I had paid the equivalent of what I would have paid had I gotten a medical degree or a, or a PhD. Wow. And and now I teach people all over the world how to do what I do. I tell people, Anna, that I'm a businesswoman who learned how to do woo-woo, and I'm a buffet of psychicness. <laughs> so that's what I teach, too. And it's it's really fun, and I get to meet people from all over, and it's it's really just a joy. Is it difficult to learn psychic abilities? Can anyone learn at any level, or it depends? No, it's not difficult at all. Everybody does it. We do it now. We're just not cognizant of it. For example, if you think of somebody and within a day or so, you'll get an email from them or a text or a phone call, or you'll run into them and you say, oh my gosh, I was just thinking of you the other day. And what a coincidence. Well, that isn't a coincidence. That's your psychic ability at work. And so we all do it. It's just a matter of honing it and developing the skill so that it's easily turned on and off at will. And, and it's fantastic what we can access. Absolutely. Now, I, I would still suggest that there is a difference between being able to read people's energy 
or pets energy or any living entities energy versus being able to heal someone because that's obviously a higher level skill. So how did you go about learning that second level skill? Well, they go hand in hand. My experience, Anna, has been when we connect to spirit, then we have the ability to facilitate energetic healings and to scan. I'm like a human MRI or X-ray or CT scan machine. I can see in my mind's eye if I'm scanning somebody anywhere, anywhere. Doesn't even have to be in our our, our on our planet. I could scan you if you were on Mars. I could scan you if you were 45,000 feet in the air, crying, flying across the Atlantic Ocean. It doesn't matter. But what happens is I connect to spirit. I raise my vibrational level because we're all spirits attached to a body, having a human experience. Most of us have heard that probably lots of times. Mm -hmm. And I raise my vibrational level. It takes a nanosecond for me to do that. And then I envision connecting with the person. I watch a laser beam in my mind's eye connect from my body to yours. For instance, like you mentioned, I'm in Alabama in the Southeastern U.S., and you're in Melbourne. So I would watch a laser beam go across oceans and continents and connect into you. And once I connect into you, which takes a nanosecond to happen, then it's as if I'm looking at an x-ray or a CT scan. And then some things identified immediately thereafter, there's an energetic healing that will take place. And that can take the form of something getting added, something getting removed. I watch procedures in my mind's eye all the time that emulate what I saw in surgeries for decades. I'm an inventor of surgical devices sold throughout the world. That's one of the companies that I've founded. Sometimes, Anna, I see healings that utilize methodologies and devices that haven't been invented yet. And regardless of what I'm seeing in my mind's eye, I'm very descriptive with what I'm seeing, because if the person can envision it, it helps integrate the healing into their physical body. At the end of the day, the healing will happen either, uh, it will happen on the energetic level, either instantly, it could take days, weeks, months, it may need some kind of complementary care, like change in diet, physical therapy, surgery, medicine, whatever. But certainly it's always our spirit's prerogative to utilize a healing or not to utilize it, whatever's best in our spirit's opinion to help us facilitate whatever it is our spirit's exploring. So in essence, nobody heals anybody else, including doctors and medical providers, because we all heal ourselves. All healers, whether it be in Western or Eastern medicine or energy healing, whatever the modality is, we're facilitating. We're the facilitator to help the person heal. And my example for that is think of if somebody has surgery at the end of the procedure, the surgeon's going to close the incision with sutures and staples. The surgeon doesn't make the patient's skin grow back. The patient makes their own skin grow back. And that's how all this works. Mm, beautiful. So is it similar to Reiki healing or is it a different modality or it doesn't matter? It's all energy. I learned Reiki first and I found that Reiki was a really good place to start. And so what I do is I would say is uh, very, very specific, very precise very uh, visual for me because I'm a visual learner. And, and then I get all kinds of feedback from my clients and callers into my show that they call in and I'll scan them on my show and do an energetic healing on my show from them from all over the world. So it's really fun. Yes, and I've listened to your show uh, to a few episodes, and it's really interesting because, as you said, people call you and then they briefly uh, they may briefly talk about their illness or their discomfort, physical discomfort. So 
you are a medical intuitive and you can sense what medical condition an ill or an illness a person has. Do you have a medical background? I'm an inventor of surgical devices, and I was involved for 30 years in the, the medical business on the hospital supply side of the equation. So I sold, gosh, everything from <laughs> Q-tips and dressings and surgical tape and things like that to equipment and surgical gowns and, oh my gosh, everything in between. And then when I was in my mid twenties, I started my first company and that led to me becoming an inventor of surgical devices. So I know enough to know something that can help me. And if I don't know, I know how to read so I can look it up early on. When I first started seeing body parts in my mind's eye, if I was scanning somebody, Anna, and I would get, well, okay, it's a liver. And then I have an anatomy book and I would look up, okay, where is the liver and what's it look like in the body? So now at this stage, I just know what it is. So I'm getting visuals, I'm watching a healing occur with spirit working through me and with me, and I'm getting information downloaded into my head. I call those divine downloads. So now when I get it's a liver, I'm picturing a liver because I know what it looks like because I've researched it. Mm, okay. So you are receiving all the information that you need to receive through the quantum field about the person's condition or particular part or organ in their body and whether you remember its location or its function doesn't really matter because this information will come to you anyway. Is it correct? It does. And now I know where everything is just because I've been doing it long <laughs> enough and with thousands of, well, really tens of thousands of people over the past five years or so. I talk to, I probably scan easily 3000 people a year. Wow. And, and, and that's not just all medical. Most of the work I do is medical, but we talk to deceased loved ones. I scan pets. We talk to pets. We do past life stuff. I can tell how close to death somebody is communicate with any spirit, whether it's attached to a body or not, it doesn't mm. matter. Spirit guides, I mean, the whole nine yards. And so it's really fun. And that's what I was talking about. When we connect with spirit, we can do it all. There's no, it's not like how we've segregated the medical industry where you got the cardiologist and the neurologist and the whateverologist. What I have found, and, and it is that way in the woo-woo industry, people are mediums or they're pet psychics or whatever. What I have found and what I teach is when we connect to spirit, you have access to all of it. It doesn't matter. Right. Do you remember your first case, the first accurate energy reading and successful healing? Must have been a long time ago. Oh, gosh, <laughs> that was 30 years ago. Uh, let me think about that. Hmm. I'll have to think about that. I can tell you when that happened about 20 years ago, that was interesting. Uh, and, and this is a fun story because my older brother, his name's Jay, he's a character. He's really a, he's a big kidder and he's very funny. And one of his best friends had a stroke and he was in surgery in a different state about, oh gosh, 10 hours from me where I grew up in Ohio and his friend was in surgery, his friend, Tim and Jay, my brother called and he said, Tim's had a stroke. He's in surgery. Do your thing. <laughs> he didn't really buy into it. Right. He just said, do your thing. Mm. And so I got Tim on my radar and I didn't think he'd make it out of surgery. Because he was in phase 11 of the 12 phases of transition. We can talk about that later, about what happens when somebody's dying. But I got information from Tim. He is a lawyer, and he and his father were doing some big business deal. And Tim wanted me to give my brother information to give to Tim's dad, who was also in the waiting room at the hospital with my brother, because they had this big deal that was happening. So Jay did that. And Tim's dad turned ashen, Anna, and he said, I have to sit down. He said, there's no way you could have known wow. that. And, and so 20 years later, Tim's up walking around and he's fine. Wow. 
Yeah. So that's the one that, that that's one that I remember because it was just so funny when my brother said, do your thing. Beautiful. So Julie, you work with the quantum field or through the quantum field to obtain information and then send the healing or facilitate the healing. Now, that's a tricky question. <laughs> How much of your energy of your energy work is science and how much of it is spirituality? Oh, great question. I think it's equal parts <laughs> of both. And I believe that the science is catching up with the woo-woo part, the spiritual part. Mm. Because the science, the the energy healing is ancient. I it's been around since the beginning of time and we're just now getting sophisticated enough with the science where different frequencies of healing can be tested in a physics lab. I have a gal who's a, a quantum physics professor at Oxford who took my class and she's brilliant and she can tell us what's going on from the quantum field when we're doing healings because she understands that mm -hmm. she's, that's what she's got her doctorate in and that's what she teaches. And so I don't, I don't really get caught up in the, how does it work? I just pay attention to the fact that it does work and it does seem to help people. But again, it's always my client's prerogative or my caller. If somebody's calling into my show, it's always their, their spirit's prerogative whether to use the healing and how they're going to use it. So all I can do is facilitate it. I can send the energy and then they pick it up and they do what they want to with it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you give a gift to somebody yeah. and whether they receive it and whatever they do with it is up to them. Mm, absolutely. If you sense that someone has a terminal illness, they may not be aware of yet. Do you tell them? I do. And I don't edit anything I get because I believe I'm the messenger. I'm the conduit to get the information to the person. And certainly I'm going to be conscious of presenting it in a way that's going to be as compassionate as possible. I'm not going to say, hey, George, you know, you're dying of cancer right now and you look awful. And no, that's not going to happen. I'm going to say, George, here's what mm -hmm. I'm seeing. I really recommend here. And then I'll describe the healing. And then I'll say, I recommend that you go see your doctor as soon as possible, but I don't edit anything that I get. Again, I believe that it's spirit working through me and with me. And if I'm getting the information that person is, person is supposed to have it, I don't worry about it because if I don't get the information then I'm not supposed to know it and convey it. Yes. That's a really good point. And I know that some psychic readers select what information that they received from the spirit about the, the client, they pass on to them or not, whether it's a medical um, intuitive reading or, or just psychic reading of any sort. And I had a conversation once with uh, such a person and I asked them, why do you do that? What, it is not your role to decide what the person needs to know and what they shouldn't know. Whatever information you have received about them, it is your role to pass it on to them. You are not to be a filter of that information because if there is something you are not supposed to know or they are not supposed to know, you simply won't get it. So exactly as you just said, but some people working in this field take upon themselves a role of a of a scrutinizer and and the filter and decide oh well no this is no 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 she can't know this so I, that's that's wrong because that goes against the whole process you are facilitating well i i i agree with that and my feeling is who in the heck am i to decide what somebody needs to hear mm. it again it's spirit working through me and with me so there's there's way more at play. There are way more variables that are part of the overall healing equation. And perhaps if I or somebody withholds information, that person doesn't go get checked. 
well, that could have facilitated them healing their bodies because they got the information from me. So plus it lets me be able to sleep at night because imagine the guilt Mm. that one would feel if they didn't convey something and that person didn't go get checked or see their doctor or, and, and again, that's always their choice, but I I'm in complete agreement with you on that. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of the spectrum, there are people who would add their own information that they believe the person would need to know without clarifying that this is my advice in addition to what I've just conveyed to you, which again is, is quite important. So while we are on this topic, let's talk about the ethics in this type of work. I think it's very important. And the best way for clients to gauge whether they feel some somebody's ethical or not is to pay attention to how they feel when they get information from the person. Does it resonate or does it feel like, oh, I'm getting scammed or this just this just isn't making sense to me. I can count on one hand, Anna, after tens of thousands of scans with people over the years. And that I guess obviously includes medical and everything else, talking to deceased loved ones and everything, where I've had a situation, I had one comes to mind where I had a man that, whose wife had died a couple of months prior to our appointment. And we were talking and the wife was the wife was very chatty, her spirit, and she was giving him all kinds of information and and giving him advice on what to do for health benefits and reasons and things like that. And he said, well, I know there's one thing she wants to tell me and uh and I'm I'm waiting for her to tell me that and well I wasn't getting what he wanted to hear and he was in obviously in deep grief still and what what he said was today is my birthday I know she wants to wish me a happy birthday well all I can do is convey the information that I'm getting I'm just the telephone operator I'm not making up the conversation mm-hmm. And so he was really upset about that. And and he said, that's just, that's the one thing I needed to hear. And I just gave him his money back because he just, I said, obviously this is not working for you. My goal is to help you have comfort, to help comfort you in this situation. And you're, that's not happening with this. Mm -hmm. And it was because he came in with, here's what I'm going to hear. And he had it already in his mind that that's what she was going to tell him. Well, okay, good thought. But if she doesn't tell you that, I'm not in control of that. So that's happened. Gosh, I can think of maybe two or three times, but it's very rare. Most people are very open to what spirit has to say. And most of the time spirit will, their deceased loved one will give them some kind of information that will bring comfort to them. I had a funny, funny situation a couple of days ago. May I share it with you? Mm -hmm. Yes, please, please do. I was talking with a client and her mother died recently in the last few months. And she said, I keep finding dimes everywhere and coins, you know, American Uh dime. She said, I find them in my house. I find them in the parking lot. I find them in the grocery store or wherever. And she said, every time I find one, I think, oh, my mom's sending me that. So the question to her mom was, are you sending me dimes? And she said, yes. And the the daughter of my client said, well, why do you keep sending me dimes? And the mother's spirit said, because I want you to know that I think you're a perfect 10. (laughs) Well, for those of your listeners that don't know, a dime in American money is 10 10 cents. Yeah. And so it was so so cute. That's a great, a great story. Another one that's fun that happened recently Mm -hmm. is a deceased mom. Again, she'd only been gone a few months. One of the things that she wanted her daughter to know was she wanted her to throw away her peanut butter 
And, you know, you expect to hear something like, I love you or do this for your job or something important and hear this mom's spirit saying, throw away your peanut butter. And the daughter said, what? And I said, she wants you to get rid of your peanut butter. And a couple of hours later, she sent me an email, Anna, with a picture on it. And it showed the expiration date on the lid of the peanut butter. Wow. And the peanut butter had expired five months prior <laughs> to the time that her mom was saying, throw away her peanut butter. So spirit was advising from heaven, you need to get rid of your peanut butter. A very useful <laughs> so advice. It's really fun <laughs> what they come in with. So with the range of your services and, and skills, medical scanning of people and pets, communication with diseased, past life readings, and also dealing with um, paranormal activities such as removing ghosts from haunted houses. Did you develop all those skills concurrently or was there a timeline of your psychic awakening and, and developing those skills? And which one is your favorite? Oh, great question. <laughs> no, they've developed over time, just with different circumstances early on. The medical came in first because that's what I was most interested in because I had been in that industry for a long time when I first started studying this woo-woo stuff. And, and even now, the majority of the work that I do is medical related, simply because people will have symptoms and they'll go to multiple doctors sometimes and they'll get different diagnoses and different treatment suggestions and they the symptoms haven't abated. So they're coming to me almost out of a sense of desperation to say, oh my gosh, nothing else has worked. Maybe I'll try this. Mm -hmm. And and then we'll reverse and I'll reverse engineer their symptoms and we'll find out what the root cause is. I spirit working through me and with me. And I had to switch to I do this because the that that uh verbiage because when I'd say, well, we it just confused people there. I'd say, what do you have a mouse in your pocket? Who's we? <laughs> and so I'll just say I and then I'll say it's spirit working through me and with me. So I would say my most favorite thing is probably the medical because I do that the most. But the other thing that's so fun is talking to deceased loved ones and the spirits of deceased pets and also past lives, Anna. That is a blast uh. because I'll get where the past life was, when it was, I'll get, normally I'll get the person's name. I'll get information about what they did. And then we'll correlate that with how does it resonate with what's happening in their current life. And sometimes we can corroborate the information that I get with historical data that we find online. So that's really fun when that happens. I have several stories about that that are fun. I'm happy to share if you'd like. Yes, please do. Please do. And but before you do, I'd like to ask a question. During your past life reading, do you put the client in a hypnotic state or or some or even down into a theta state? Do they need to go into meditation and they experience what is coming through? Or is it just you receiving the information and then passing on to the client? It's the latter. I receive the information and pass it on to the client because I'm an entrepreneur. I like to do things my way. <laughs> you know, if somebody Fair says, <laughs> well, you can, you can only do past life readings if you put somebody under a hypnotic state. I'm like, yeah, well, good luck with that. I'm not going to do that. I just want to <laughs> do fast, quick, get the information, move on. Let's do something else. Because when I have somebody in a private session for an hour, we're covering a lot of territory. We'll do medical. We can do pet. We can scan family members with their permission. We can do past life stuff. We can talk to deceased loved ones. So it's a fast paced hour and we cover a lot of information. And here's how I do past life scan. I call them past life scans. I envision myself in this endless hallway and, uh, and it, it has very tall ceilings, very narrow walls. The walls are lined with 
big square mirrors and they're perfectly aligned in vertical and horizontal rows, ceiling to floor. Each mirror represents a different lifetime. So I'll ask a question like, was Anna a scientist in a past life? And the mirrors that correlate with that question will come out from the wall as if they're on a hydraulic arm. And then I'll say, show me the one that correlates the most. That one will come out the farthest. And then I'll envision myself walking into that mirror, kind of like Alice in the looking glass, you know, in Alice in Wonderland. Uh And I'll be shown this scene and I'll be given where it was, when it was a little bit about what happened. And then we'll get information about it. And then we'll figure out how it correlates Mm. with what's going on in their current life. It's fascinating. And there's always something that resonates about what's happening in the current life. Could you share a couple of really interesting examples of your past life readings? Obviously, sure. Anonymously. (laughs) Sure, sure. One of my favorites, I was talking to a flight attendant who is an Italian gal and she was living in London at the time. And she was flying for ANA Airlines, the Japanese airline. And her, uh, her training was in Kyoto, Japan. So back up a little bit. She wanted to know why she kept choosing men that wouldn't commit. They wouldn't marry her or men would come after her who, who were already married or something. I mean, she, she wanted to be married and have a family and she was not finding a man that was willing to do that with her. And she thought, well, maybe I have an energy block or something. So I did this past life thing. I got that she was a geisha in Kyoto, Japan at the turn of the 20th century. And she was a kept woman. The geishas back then, they had sponsors and normally those men were married and had families. So I think in a lot of instances, there was a lot of love there between the man and the geisha, but the geisha could never have them. And so when I told my client, whose name's Anna, by the way, when I told (laughs) Anna this, Mm -hmm. she gasped. And I said, what? And she said, I went to my training in Kyoto. And when I landed and went to the training facility, I felt like I knew the place. She said, it was so interesting. It just resonated with every fiber of my being. I thought I have been here before. And then she said, when they had lunch the first day, she said, I'm an Italian girl. I've never even picked up chopsticks, let alone tried to eat with them. She said, I knew how to use them. And she said, all my classmates were all Japanese. And they said, my gosh, you use chopsticks better than we do. And we've been using them all (laughs) all our lives. And she said, now that makes sense. Well, fast forward, we pointed out, okay, what's the correlation between that? She was a geisha that couldn't have the man that she loved. And in this life, she kept choosing men that she couldn't love or that wouldn't love her back and wouldn't commit. So within a couple of months, she met somebody and a year later was married to him. So that's kind of a fun story. Yes, yes. Interesting. So can you use any specific information from a past life that is affecting the person now in a way that it removes the blockage? Yes, absolutely. Just that knowledge, like in Anna's case, uh, she understood why she kept choosing these men. And once she had that knowledge, she stopped choosing those men. She stopped attracting them. Right. Because her vibration was different because she understood it. But how I remove blockages is I go into what I call the energy field membrane, Anna. And that's the container that holds the energy that makes up our body and our spirit. And it reminds me of really thin, stretchy plastic wrap the kind that you'd get on a tray of chicken breast from the grocery store. You know how that stuff's thinner than the plastic wrap perhaps that's in our kitchen drawers in a box. And, And I'll go into that and I'll be shown a scene of some emotional event, either from this life or a past life that has formed an energy block. And by illuminating it, we eradicate it. It removes it, removes all the other energy blocks that are in there that have happened over a lifetime. And then that allows the the energy filled membrane to heal, allows the body to go back to working on full power. 
because the spirit is the power source for the body. When somebody dies, their spirit and their body separates. So the body doesn't work any longer because it doesn't have a power source. And a, a, an analogy I find that's really helpful for this is imagine if you went to buy a goldfish at a pet store, they're going to put it in a plastic bag of water in order for you to get it home. Well, if you have a picture of that in your mind's eye, the fish represents our body, the water represents our spirit, and the plastic bag represents our energy field membrane Yeah, container. So if that plastic bag has a pinhole in it and water is draining out a drop at a time, for a long time, that fish is going to be fine. However, when enough energy, enough water drains out or energy in a human's perspective, if enough water drains out, that fish is going to be in trouble. And that's what happens to the human body. And I'm not going for the most traumatic thing that's happened to the person. I'm going for where did that block start? And sometimes it's brought forward from a past life. I really love that metaphor, fish in a plastic bag with water. Yeah, it's it's really good. Well, thanks. <laughs> really, really, really good. So do you do this healing part uh, or healing blockages with every past life reading or only when it is needed? Because I guess some people might be simply interested, curious about their past lives, not necessarily trying to find the cause of any particular issue. So I gather that these readings would be on the whole spectrum from just curiosity reading to let's find the cause of your issue. Is it right? I do it every time with private clients on a medical reading, medical scan and energy healing, because okay. it's the most important part of a healing. In my opinion, we can fix body parts all day long, but if we're leaking power, what's the point? What's the, what's the point if we're leaking energy, we need to fix that. It would be the equivalent of if your car was, wasn't working properly and you took it to the mechanic and they put a new radiator in your car, but you had a dead battery, the car still wouldn't start. Mm. Well, what's the point of yeah. the new radiator if the car still won't run? Yeah. I don't do the energy field membrane healing much on my show because I don't have time. I'm trying to get as many people on as I can and get their symptoms diagnosed and facilitate a healing. But if it's somebody that has a lot going on, I'll say, please consider scheduling an appointment with me and let's take an hour to do a deep dive on whatever's going on. On the past life stuff though, the the what I like to use as, as an analogy for that is will when we are born, we come in with a script and lots of subscripts of things that we want to explore in the human form, if you will. So past lives, what I find is there will be oftentimes a semblance of that script that runs through many lifetimes. And we're looking at, at it from a different perspective. And the analogy I like to use for this, Anna, is think of Hamlet. How many times has Hamlet been performed since Shakespeare wrote it in 1602? Who knows? Mm. But if you think about <laughs> same script, but in what country, in what language, inside, outside, what city, what was happening in the world at the time, who were the actors, who was the director, what was the interpretation of the same script that has been performed repeatedly millions of times, I'm sure, certainly, and uh, just different perspective. So each time we explore something from a different perspective, our spirit expands and we contribute to the collective consciousness. So now we're getting into your expertise, the collective consciousness and the, you know, all knowledge that we all share and we all have access to. Have you had any particularly scary or uncomfortable cases, whether medical scans or past life readings or communicating with, uh, with the deceased? Any like hairy, scary cases? 
<laughs> well, not with any clients, but I did, oh gosh, probably, oh, maybe 15 years ago. And I was, I was meeting a friend at his office and we were going to go out to dinner and he kept telling me that his building was haunted. He said, my, my building is haunted where I work. And he'd tell me about doors opening and stuff like that. And I'd say, okay. So I went to meet him and then he, he said, just come with me and I'm going to just be sure everything's all locked up. So we went down to the lower level and he said, are you picking up anything? And I said, like what? And he said, well, you know, any paranormal activity, excuse me. And I said, well, I don't have my radar turned on. So it took me a nanosecond. I turned my radar on and there, and there were a lot of spirits that were in that area of the building. And at one point we were in a hallway and a door opened and a spirit walked through the door. And and there's a whole chapter about it in my book. Physically opened. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. While we were standing there. And of course it was thundering and lightning and pouring down rain outside. And I thought, oh my gosh, perfect for a haunted movie, (laughs) you know, the (laughs) setting. Absolutely. And that freaked me out a little bit because I thought, whoa. And, And when a spirit is around, especially when we don't expect it, sometimes people say, oh my God, the hair on the back of my neck stood up or my, I had goosebumps all over my body or chill bumps all over my body. Well, that's because the spirit's energy is such a high frequency and because it doesn't have a dense body that it's attached to. Mm -hmm. And so our bodies are sensing that difference in the vibration and that's, what's causing that. So then when we went to a different part of the building, there were these spirits that it was energy that was flying around. And it reminded me of something out of Harry Potter, the, you know, the faceless guys with the capes on and they were flying around Uh, and it, and it was negative energy being shown to me in a way. So I could understand that it was negative energy. So I said to my friend, what goes on in that conference room? Are you guys snarky with each other? And he said, Oh yeah. He said, there's lots of fighting and posturing and egos and stuff like that. And I said, all right, well, that's the energy that's coming out of that room. And so we cleared it and spirits, pure love. It's just different frequencies of the vibration. Yeah. So people say to me, well, what about evil spirits? What about hell? What about all of that? And I say, well, that's just all created by religions and cultures and, and governments to control the masses, all spirits, pure love. And our interpretation of that is going to be based on our frame of reference for that. Yes, yes, absolutely. In your work with haunted houses and with ghosts, do you ever get direct communication from those spirits, those ghosts, or not? Oh, every time. You do? Every time. Yeah, I talk to them. You know, what do you you need? Usually it's, it's a spirit that doesn't know they're dead. They've already gone to heaven. Here's my take on it. Mm -hmm. Who knows if this is true or not? Certainly it's feasible to me, but my take is everybody goes to heaven when they die. Heaven is non-physical. I'm using air quotes for listeners. And, uh, and so they, that spirit wants to have the experience of kind of one foot in the human world, one foot in the spirit world. And so they will come explore what that feels like where they're still in, in the human world as if they're still alive, but they're not, they're in spirit form. And again, that chapter in my book is all about this train wreck that happened. And there were stowaways on the train and we talked to them and they gave my friend all kinds of information about other people that, that worked there with him and Mm -hmm. who he could trust and who he couldn't trust. It was wild. And then it's it's interesting what they are looking for. Normally, they're looking for a, another loved one. Great story. One of my favorites is my daughter-in-law. When she was in high school, she and my son dated in high school and then through college and then got married. And one year when she was in high school, they were at her grandmother's house for Thanksgiving. And the mo- her mom and her aunt and her grandmother were all in the kitchen. 
and her grandmother had antique kitchen utensils hanging on the wall as decorative items. Well, they all three of them watched these spoons and things come off of their come off of the wall and <laughs> fall on the countertop. Uh-huh. <laughs> and they were all saying, "Holy Moses, what is this?" So, of course, they're on the phone with me saying, "Can you scan this? What the heck's going on?" Cuz they had a house full of family there for the holiday. And was grandma dead or alive? Grandma was alive. Grandma was in the kitchen cooking. Yeah, grandma saw it too. She's still alive now. She's in her late 80s. And so what I got was, it was a, a farm. That house was on land that was originally a farm. And I got the family's name. And I got that it was the father was there who was the farmer. And one of his sons was a Confederate soldier in the war between the states and the U.S., the, what we call the Civil War, what was the North versus the South. And so this soldier died in battle, but he was coming to look for his little girl. And he gave me the, I'm, I'm talking with them. They're telling me their name. They're telling me what's going on, all this stuff and the daughter's name. So what I did was I pulled the daughter in. She was in heaven. I pulled her in. I said, can you help your dad and your granddad go on? you know, back with you to heaven. And she did. So Anna, the fun part about that was within a couple of days, one of the grandsons who was getting his doctorate in college, he in grad school, he looked up all this stuff. Well, they found the deed to the property. It was in fact a farm. They found the family name. They found the dates that they told us that they owned the the farm and and then a housing development had been built on that land that had belonged to that family. So one of many fun stories where we can corroborate the information we get from spirit. <laughs> Absolutely. Great story. And it has reminded me of my very interesting experience with a spirit in my kitchen, which I I would like to share. I've never shared it with anyone. It happened earlier this year, so a few months ago. I think on that very day, I was chatting via email with one of my earlier podcast guests with whom I did an episode on the other side, and including ghosts, haunted houses, et cetera. So we were chatting about this. And then we we finished chatting and I went to my kitchen. I was cooking something. I think I was cooking just a few eggs in a small pot, which I covered with a glass lid. Now, I've done it many times before. As you know, the glass lid is about... Oh, it's quite thick. It's about a quarter inch thick because it's meant to obviously be for cooking. So I was standing in the kitchen doing something, I think chopping something on, on the board. And, and I was about, I don't know, maybe three, four feet from the stove. And suddenly I heard this almighty boom. And I said, oh my God, what happened? The lid exploded. It didn't just fell off onto the ground because of the force of the steam. No, the lid was in place, but it was shattered. Oh my. Like completely shattered. So obviously some pieces, you know, flew all over. Luckily, you know, I didn't didn't get any on me because I was, I guess, far enough. But I have never seen anything like that. And the energy was very angry. Huh. Because I also work with energy and I'm very sensitive to energy. And I could tell that this energy was extremely angry that just shattered that glass lid. So I quickly went back to my email and I, <laughs> to my, to, to that person I was ch- chatting with. And she said, yep, you've got an angry spirit in your house. <laughs> so I said, so what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> so she gave me some instructions and what to do to, well, ask the spirit, that energy to please leave my house. But it was so angry and I couldn't understand why it was angry. And I was thinking maybe it has something to do 
with our conversation about ghosts and haunted houses because we were planning to invite her back on my show to talk more about those topics and, and other things. I mean, it wasn't you know coincident. I mean, I don't believe in coincidences anyway, but it was so powerful. It was almost like that energy wanted to tell me or to show me in no uncertain terms, I'm here, I'm angry, so you watch out. <laughs> That was really, really unusual. So anyway, I went through the couple of exercises that she gave me to remove that spirit. And I think it left. <laughs> but I will never forget this because it is physically impossible for just the steam from boiling water to shatter a quarter of an inch glass lid. I mean, it, it just doesn't happen. What do you think? <laughs> well, here's my take on that. First of all, all spirits are pure love. An angry spirit is is humans putting an emotion on a spirit that doesn't have emotion because spirits are all just pure love. Spirits are like the sun. The sun does one thing, Anna. It shines. That's it. The sun doesn't care if it's raining where you are, if it's snowing, if it's hot, if it's cold, doesn't matter. The sun's just going to shine. That's what spirits do. I think that's a great example of perspective. Your perspective was that that spirit was angry. That was you putting that perspective on that energy. Was it energy from a spirit that was trying to get your attention? Absolutely. Did it use a lot of force to get your attention? Absolutely. Was it angry? No. And all spirits will leave if we ask them to. If you just say, hey, you know, this is kind of freaking me out. You need to leave or you need to leave right now because we're way more powerful in our bodies when we're spirits attached to a body than, than when we're just in non-physical form. So what I would suggest is talk to the spirit at the time if, it, if something like that ever happens again and say, what is it you want me to know? Because when we're in fear, like, oh my God, there's an evil spirit in my house. We're out of connection with spirit because spirit's pure mm. love. So our vibration is low when we're in fear and spirit doesn't communicate on the, I feel crappy channels because the vibration's too low. So you close yourself off from what's really going on here. And what does the spirit want to convey until you can get yourself settled down enough that you can be back in alignment with energy yeah. of spirit to find out what's going on. This does resonate with me, what you just said, but I wasn't angry at the time. I wasn't in a negative mood. In fact, I was a, in a very good mood because we were planning another, another show with her. So I don't know where my thought of, of anger came from, maybe because of the sheer physical impact. Yeah. I mean, it exploded. It literally exploded. And half of the lid, half of it came obviously flying on the floor and half of it stayed in the lid. But right. maybe the sheer force was what I associated with anger. Right. Well, we're always going to go to fear first. We're all hardwired for fear. You know, we're looking for the saber toothed tiger that's going to come eat us for lunch, although he's been dead for a really long time. He's been extinct. But what I get from that situation is that that spirit wanted to get your attention. You weren't injured, mm -hmm. wanted to get you. I mean, my goodness, even the boiling water could have burned you yeah. coming from that. But what I got was your the spirit wanted to get your attention because of perhaps looking at something from a different perspective, the person with whom you were conveying was of the understanding that there are evil spirits, that there are angry spirits, that there all are all of that. And so that spirit, here's my take on it. That spirit was like, you know, let me get her attention so that she can perhaps listen to a different point of view <laughs> and, and see it from a different perspective. Maybe it took until, I, I don't know, you may have gotten this perspective from somebody else, but certainly you're getting it from me. Spirits are all pure love. There is no such thing as an angry spirit, as a, a uh, evil spirit. 
whatever evilness exists in the human perspective. Absolutely. But those personality traits, those characteristics stay with the body when somebody dies. And that really makes some people's heads want to explode because they'll think of like a Hitler. I'll say, how can Hitler be in heaven? How can his spirit be pure love? Well, his spirit's pure love And it came to explore and experience what it was like to be, you know, a nutcase and, and evil and, and all of that. So that's my perspective on it. Is it true? That's my perspective. We'll find out when we go back into non-physical, certainly feasible. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, that spirit, whatever it was, did get my attention all right. <laughs> I'm glad you weren't hurt. Yes, me too. But there was glass all over. I think there were a couple of pieces even on, you know, on my clothes. But uh, and by the way, just very quickly, I wasn't really afraid. I just said, "Oh my God, you know what happened?" And also, I didn't feel it was an evil spirit. I, I don't believe in that either, or at least not in this case. I did think that it was an angry spirit because of the sheer physical force of that incident. But um, yeah, I mean, it all ended well. So <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and perhaps it was, we could rephrase that and say it was a powerful spirit. It was a spirit who was able to control its energy so that it was a powerful sign to me that there was something going on and I needed to pay attention. <laughs> well, I would need to go back and think, you know, what was going on in my life maybe at the time. But yeah, it was, it was really, really interesting. Okay, Julie, let's now talk about your books. You have written and published four books, as I understand. And uh, of course, I will include all the links in the show notes. Now, there are three angelic messages for cats, then for dogs and for kids. And the fourth book is Angelic Attendance. These books, at least the first three, are clearly written for children. And I must say, I love the illustrations. I absolutely love it. It beautiful, stunning illustrations and great books for children anyway, in terms of how you present those difficult and complex issues in such a very simple and, and beautiful way. So could you talk for a moment about your books how did you come up with an idea to write them for children and about your connection with the angels? Sure. I'd be delighted to. The children's books came about, Anna, because I had so many moms over the years say, can you please write a children's book that will help me explain to my child what happens when somebody dies? Because we'll say to little Johnny, well, grandma's in heaven. And he'll say, no, she's not. She's asleep in that box up there because they're at the funeral home for the visitation hours. You know, how do you explain that to a Mm three-year-old? And then I had mom say, can you please write a book that will help me explain to my child how they are able to communicate with a deceased loved one who's been dead for 20 years and this child never met this person. And perhaps it's it's a deceased grandfather who plays trains with the little Susie when she's in her bedroom or she's in her crib. And and the stories are just endless about the information that these children tell their parents. And and it's sometimes it's information that the parents don't even know. And then they get it corroborated with the remaining spouse or the, you know, the child's grandmother whose father is visiting the child in spirit form. So mommy and daddy can't see the spirit, but, but the child can. And then lastly, can you explain, I had mom say, can you please explain how my child knows information about past lives? And my, I just had this conversation over the weekend. One of my best friends was telling me that her three-year-old grandson, his name's Rory, was talking about his life with his other family and they had brown skin and they lived in Kenya and they lived in this village and he gave the name and they were able to look it up and find it. Well, this child can't read yet. So how does this child know this stuff? There's no way. And we all have the ability as we 
talked about before, Anna. And I, what I find is that it starts to get shut down about the age of maybe six or seven when children have been told, well, honey, that's just your imagination. That's not really real. It's just your imagination. Yeah. And they, they've heard that from parents or grandparents or teachers or, or friends. And so they shut it down. So the books were intended to help explain that and to help foster that information and that intuition with children so that they don't shut it down because my gosh, it's Mm. to your point earlier, it's a sixth sense and it's so valuable to help them navigate through this human experience. So that's the children's books. And the fourth one will be out at the end of the year. I'm working on the fourth one. Okay. And there, and my illustrator, thank you for mentioning that my illustrator was a fashion designer in London and she had children and she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. And so she went and trained how to be a children's book illustrator. So they're very colorful and they, they really are terrific. Thank you for mentioning that. Okay. And also I understand, Julie, that you have a little gift for our listeners. I do. My children's books and my my book for grown-ups, Angelic Attendance, What Happens as We Transition from This Life into the Next. Any of your listeners, Anna, that would like a copy, I'm happy to send a free copy and just go to AskJulieRyan.com, go to the Ask Julie page and just say, I heard you on Anna's show. I'd love a copy of your book. And if you have kids or grandkids, just say, I'd love a copy of your children's books as well. And we'll send you a link for a free download to all of them. And just as a thank you for listening today to our chat. Thank you so much on behalf of our listeners. Okay, Julie, what would be your final message, your final comments, the way you would like to wrap up this conversation for us and to leave our audience with? Spirit's pure love. We all have the ability to access communication with spirit and it's our It's just innate. We all have the ability to develop and then enhance it. And it brings so much joy to our lives and to the lives of others. And that would be number one. And then number two, just we're here to live a life of joy. And when we get caught up in the the minutia, the mundane, the day-to-day things that upset us, all we have to do is remember that we're here to live a life of joy and does it really matter? And 99.9% of the time it doesn't. And in my grown up book, Angelic Attendance, what I talk about is when somebody dies, how we're, we're escorted to eight, to heaven with angels. We're surrounded by angels and our deceased loved ones. And when we know about death, what's going to happen and how glorious it is, it helps us live a better life because the fear is reduced Anna. And and the worst thing that can happen is we die and we're carried to heaven, escorted by angels and surrounded by loved ones. If that's the worst thing that can happen, we're all in good shape. So <laughs> take those chances, live your life. If you feel fear about something, is this a real fear? The only time it's a real fear is if it's going to hurt you or kill you, hurt you physically or kill you. Everything else is all imagined. It's all false. And when we understand that it helps us live a life of joy and and really make it a, an adventure that's enjoyable. Beautiful, beautifully said. Well, thank you, Julie, so much. It's been such a pleasure to have you on my show and have this really fun conversation. So I really, really appreciate uh, your beautiful presence, your beautiful energy and your time. Thank you so much. What a delight to be with you. Thank you so much, Julie, and all the best. Thank you. So, once again, if you'd like to claim Julie's special offer, a free book, Angelic Attendance, What Really Happens As We Transition From This Life Into The Next, please go to askjulieryan.com forward slash ask hyphen Julie and mention that you heard Julie on my Quantum Living show and would like a copy of her book. You can also mention if you would like the children's book as well, and Julie will organize that. 
That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes and other podcast info, please go to my website at quantumliving.com.au forward slash podcast. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.